Well, we're here at the 2015 Historic Sandown with one of the, uh, the legends of Australian motorsport, one of our most successful international drivers, but he's raced in Formula One, in, in one Le Mans 24 hour, won the Macau Grand Prix. He was a Indianapolis 500 Rookie of the Year. He was also second here at this very track in the Australian Grand Prix way back when. And it's a great honor to say that joining us this week on In Pit Lane is Vern Chupin. Vern, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Now, let, let's start with your, uh, well, let's start here. See, we're at Sandown. Let's talk about Sandown first. And let's talk about your experience here in Formula 5000 and that famous race, that Australian Grand Prix, where we you know, sort of missed it by that much. Yeah, it was, um, it was a good race. Um, ended up, you know, obviously Johnny Goss and I having a, a pretty good dice and um, uh, I'd broken a, um, a valve spring on the on the Elfin, um, so she was down on grunt a little bit on the straight, but uh, pretty good through the corners and that. So Gossie and I, uh, I had one almost final lunge at him on the last lap, and uh, uh, it was just, uh, it was, we probably would have come together <laughs> at the first turn down here, so uh, uh, we both enjoyed the race. I know Gossie. I think he left the wreath around his neck for a few weeks. He still uh, talks about it as being uh, probably the, the highlight of his career, you know, winning the Australian Grand Prix, which I can appreciate. And the interesting thing about that, I don't know whether it was done subsequent or uh, it'll probably certainly almost never be done again, is you had two Australian built cars and John was driving the Matic and you were, of course, in the Elfin. And yes, that's right, yeah. It was, and that Matic was a pretty, pretty quick little car, as, uh, as everyone knows. You drove a number of Formula 5000s over the years. The Elfin wasn't the only thing. You've driven Lolas and um, Eagles and that sort of thing over there. So what are your memories of Formula 5000? Uh, well, I remember the first time I saw a Formula 5000 race in the UK. Um, we first uh, went over there in 1969. And uh, I remember the 5000s at Brands Hatch. And I just thought, you know, they were the greatest thing. They sounded so great, they looked good. You know, it looked like Formula One cars, but with a thumping great V8 in the back. And uh, a couple of years later, or was that actually 1973, uh, I was at Watkins Glen and Frank Maddich gave me, a, he said, would you like to drive our spare car? Which, of course, was a fantastic opportunity because Watkins Glen anyway was uh, an amazing fabled circuit and uh, I practiced the car, but unfortunately um, they suffered from um, a problem with the, uh, the sump where the baffles came loose and uh, never got to actually race it. But I've never forgotten the fact that uh, Frank just popped me in the car and uh, you know, treated me <laughs> as though I was a very professional driver and I had a, that was my first Formula 5000 race. And then I went on to drive for Sid Taylor uh, in Europe and uh, Teddy Yip, uh, first of all in a Trojan, uh, which was a good car. We first um, did a test in the car at Alton Park and uh, it was slightly damp and I remember having um, a spin and just touching the barrier, damaging the nose and I thought, oh, well that's the end of my 5000 drive, you know. Um, but Sid came around and he said, no, 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 he said, you know, he said, the last lap you did would have put you on the front row of the grid at the last race. So he said, it'd be different if you were not trying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had a, you know, a good career then after the Trojan, uh, with a, uh, Brian, I took over Brian Redmond's T332 Lola when uh, Brian went to America. And uh, yeah, it was uh, probably, I think, the, the most enjoyable cars really that I drove. Uh, during my race career. And you, you drove so many, and the interesting thing was, I mean, your, your career in Australia was basically in carts, and then you went straight over to Europe. So why the decision there? I mean, it was a big jump going, you know, going from carts just straight in, and you didn't go into Formula Ford or anything. And well, I mean, um, I worked for my dad uh, in the crash repair business, and uh, I used to, well, prior to that, um, I went to college for a year in Adelaide, and um, Concordia College and uh, uh, I used to ride my bike down to see Gary Cooper and look at the Elfins being put together and Formula Juniors and things like this which were kind of the car of the day and uh, that sort of inspired me and also I used to go also go to my uncle and aunties on a Friday night 
and they'd take me to Rolly Park. So I... That's the, that's the speedway. Which was the speedway, yeah. you know, a famous speedway in Adelaide. And, um, uh, you know, that was just unbelievable racing. And um, so I sort of grew up with cars in Dad's business and then working as a panel beater spray painter. Uh, and I started to get some bits together, Volkswagen gearbox and things, and thought, I'll, uh, I'll you know, maybe build a Formula t uh, Junior. And my dad just exploded. He said, there's no way you're going to... As a matter of fact, my dad, I was pretty good at push bike riding at school. He used to kind of beat the other kids. Uh, and I wanted to race bikes. And he said, that's way too dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so he wouldn't have a bar of the car racing. And uh, it was only um, to kind of uh, maybe satisfy my uh, desire to go racing, he helped me buy a go-kart, which kind of exacerbated the situation because I'd won the mm -hmm. Victorian titles and the East and South Australian titles a couple of times. And, uh, um, so did you ever get used to the fact that you had taken up a career in motorsport? No, not, not really. Um, Jennifer and I were married in uh, 1967. I'd stopped kart ra racing the karts. But prior to that, I'd had a sort of working holiday overseas. I planned to go for two years and we'd started going together. So I only went for four months. So I'd better come back. She won't be around when I come home otherwise. Um, but that sort of whetted my appetite to go back. And while I'd been over there, I'd gone to Goodwood and seen Graham Hill and pieces, people like that uh, racing. And um, so uh, I thought, well, let's go off for a couple of years and I'd try my hand at car racing and had $5,000 saved up and a Ford Thames van. And we put it on the ship in Adelaide at the Angelina Lauro and sailed to England. And uh, my dad really never, he said, if you go, don't come back. <laughs> but it was, um, I think um, through the local Wyler News, they started phoning him up about, you know, oh, your son's going all right in Europe. And uh, he kind of came around after a year and mum and dad came over to see me uh, at that time race, uh, race in Formula Ford. Uh, well, you were very successful in, in England and in going through into even things like Formula Atlantic, but eventually you went into to Formula One. But I believe sort of when, you, when your first Formula One start was sort of somewhat aborted um, when your teammate sort of commandeered your car. Is, is that true? And I think it's, it's a name that, we've, that we know fairly well. Yeah, it is. Um, well, being, because I'd won the Formula Channel, well, while I was doing Formula Atlantic, I had a, uh, a motor, BRM loaned me a motor. So it was essentially a BRM conversion of the latest twin cam. And, um, I won the first race and I was winning some races and going pretty well. And um, Lewis Stanley, as Big Lou is known, as a running BRM, and uh, he got me in the office one day with uh, Mrs. Stanley and they, sat, they always interviewed people together. And uh, he said, uh, if you win the championship, we'll give you a Formula One test. And the test turned out to be um, putting me in a in a Formula One race, which was the Gold Cup at Alton Park. And uh, all the Formula One teams were there with the exception of Ferrari. And anyway, I finished fifth in that race. And um, following that, they gave me another race at Brands Hatch. Um, this was in 1972. And um, uh, that was a race of champions, which again is a non-championship Formula One race, but you were competing with all the regulars, again with the exception of Ferrari, um, and I finished fourth in my second race. So uh, I had a call about midnight that night from Lewis Stanley and um, asked me to come to Silverstone. And um, I, I had a, another test with also another driver, Roger Williamson. And I think uh, BRM were quite keen on, or well, Lewis Stanley was quite keen on Roger because uh, Tom Wheatcroft was his backer. Mm. And I think they probably would have, you know, maybe gone that way. But anyway, I, I was, Roger and I were, I can remember the lap time I did. I was, we were almost the same, but I was one tenth, I think, quicker, seven, 70, uh, or, or what, 
79 one or something like that anyway. Um, after that sort of test, I, again, I had a midnight call from Mr. Stanley and uh, he said, uh, meet me at the Dorchester Hotel at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon and he had a contract for the 19, uh, seven, uh, yeah, the 73 Formula One season. And so my, um, that was to be myself and Clay Regazzoni. Mm -hmm. And then they signed Beltoise. They planned to run a three car team. And while Jen and I were back in Australia for Christmas, um, Nicky Lauder came, came along and, uh, with some money and uh, essentially he bought my position. I was still under contract, but I was a reserve driver. So um, just getting you know, the, the race in Belgium, which I would have done, um, that uh, went to, well, Helmut Marco had, had a problem with his car and uh, he took over my took over my car, which is kind of the normal thing if you are a reserve driver or the beginning the third, of a long history the third of, driver. Of, yeah. of Australians being annoyed by Helmut Marco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Now, after you, you raced uh, for, for BRM, you, you raced Ensign as well for late, later. Um, yeah. So, so at what point in the, the, the Formula One career did you decide that you know that perhaps to look? Um, overseas to the United States. What was the move from Europe to, to the US and well, what things happened like with, IndyCar and that sort of thing? Yeah, what happened with Ensign? Um, during 1973, uh, because I was under contract to BRM, I couldn't drive for another team. And, um, you know, <clears throat> you're sort of quickly forgotten about those results I'd, I'd had, you know, in 72. Um, so if you're sitting a season out, I had one race in 73 again at Brands Hatch and uh, qualified um, alongside Nicky Lauder and Beltoise. We were all in the BRM, so they were, they were a pretty good car. Um, but then had to sit the rest of the year out. And uh, I had no prospects of a Formula One drive for 1974. And we were, Teddy Ip and I were driving up to Silverstone as I'd been racing for Teddy in Macau. And uh, we were going up the N1 and he said, uh, why don't we get a car and go to Monaco and do the Monaco Grand Prix? I said, well, it's not that easy, Teddy, you know, just to, to you know, get a Formula One car for a one-off race. That's just about impossible. He said, oh, you know, let's go and talk to Bernie and this, that and the other. Um, anyway, it turned out that uh, the only car available was the Ensign, <clears throat> which hadn't qualified in the first four Grand Prix's and uh, it was actually running at Silverson. Brian Redman was driving it, Daily Express trophy race. Uh, so, yeah, cut a long story short, um, Teddy cut a deal with um, Mo Nunn for me to drive the car for the rest of the season. And uh, with t uh, Sid Taylor was sort of involved in, sort of in the background, if you like. And, um, my first race then was the Belgian Grand Prix, which I should have done previously in the BRM. And uh, I qualified, I think, 17th or something. A anyway, that was a problem for Bernie because um, he made a deal with the organisers for 22 cars on the grid of all the Grand Prix. And when we got to Dijon, he wouldn't let us, you know, go out for practice or qualify. He said, you're not part of the deal I've made, the package, you know, was 22 cars. So and nothing's changed in that respect? No, no. And um, uh, it was only after Mo threatened legal action and putting an injunction on the Grand Prix <laughs> that um, I was allowed to go out. And I only went out in literally the last session and I didn't qualify. Um, but then I went to Monaco and qualified for the Monaco Grand Prix. So it was kind of a... It wasn't a very happy union with Mo Nunn because Mo thought the car was great. He didn't think Redmond was very good, and which Redmond, as we all know, is one of the best drivers yes. of that period in the world. And uh, so after the German Grand Prix at uh, the old Nürburgring, um, I'd had a sticking, the throttle was stuck wide open, and I stripped two of the gears, um, came in, went back out again, less two gears, and Afterwards, um, Mo said, oh, you know, you're not going that well. You know, you're racing with Leila Lombardi. And I said, well, 
I said, for God's sake, what do you reckon? You know, three gears in a speed gearbox. But I just decided after that I, I didn't need Formula One that badly to be, you know, driving a bad car for a guy who thought the car's great, all, of the, all the drivers were bad, and uh, I just walked away from Formula One basically, but then got a couple more drives once at uh, the Swedish Grand Prix for Graham Hill when uh, invariably these things happen because another driver's hurt himself and Rolf Stomlin had had an accident in the Spanish Grand Prix. And then, um, and then uh, but I was offered to drive for Dan Gurney in America in Formula 5000, and I'd been doing 5000 uh, with obviously not Formula One, I'd been driving 5000s in 74 and 75 in Europe. So I went to drive for Gurney in 75 and I got a call from John Surtees while I was driving for Dan to, could I come over and do a few races? Uh, and that was replacing Larry Perkins. <laughs> Larry hadn't qualified, so it wasn't a very good, it wasn't a particularly uh, competitive car either. Um, because in those days, um, Invariably, the second car was not necessarily as good as the first car. And just in the case of the Surtees, uh, Brambilla was the other driver, and Vittorio, as John called him, uh, crashed, had 22 crashes out of 17 starts. Yes, he was sort of the, the Pastor Maldonado of, a, of an older generation. And he did win the Austrian Grand Prix going backwards over the line in the rain. <laughs> the wet, but yes. <laughs> but um, uh, what happened in Austria, the pre when I drove for John, uh, Vittorio had also crashed his race car and um, I think used up this other car, or no, they had a spare car, which was called the mule car, a bit of a tired old animal. Um, so I then got relegated, taken out of my car and put into the spare car. And I'd been complaining to John about my engine. I said, doesn't have as much grunt as Vittorio's, you know, it's felt like it's about 50 horsepower down. And he said, no, 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 exactly the same engine, you know, like this. But as soon as uh, Vittorio needed my car, they took my engine out and put his <laughs> motor in it. So, you know, Cosworth had some new in, uh, Cosworths with a new magnesium heads and we kind of knew that they were not quite the same. <laughs> you mentioned uh, briefly on, on the way through, you mentioned Macau and Macau, the Macau Grand Prix coming up next weekend. Um, you, you, you won two Macau Grand Prix, um, one of them by, how many laps was it? Oh. Would have been a couple, probably. I believe it was four. Was it? <laughs> four. Like, how, do you, how do you possibly win the Macau Grand Prix by, by I, don't care, I don't care what the, the, the quality of the field was, just to beat anybody by more than one lap on Macau was just extraordinary. Well, pro probably uh, quite a few cars would drop out or crash in Macau, so <laughs> there was a fair rate of attrition there. You know, but probably half the field finished or something. So but, what are your uh, memories of that track? It's another, another iconic event. Yeah, yeah, it was a fantastic track. I drove there in uh, 1972 and um, I bought a new March, which I ran in Singapore, and then met Teddy Yip there and he said, um, why don't you come out to Macau, you know, and do the Macau Grand Prix. I did Singapore. A lot of the Australians used to do the the old Singapore Grand Prix. Yeah, it was very big in that day. There was even it an was Indonesian a big. Grand Prix. Gary Cooper and John yeah. all those people, Kevin Bartlett, they would all do those. Yeah, So absolutely. there was a whole sort of, sort yeah. of Asia Pacific. Yeah, Bobby, Bobby yeah. Muir and there was a whole host of New Zealand drivers and, um, and Aussies. Uh, Singapore Grand Prix and um, the Malaysian Grand Prix. And uh, so I did both those, but uh, I was second in the first year to, I think Max, Max won it, Max Stewart won it. I was second. And then uh, Teddy was there and he said, well, you know, then why don't you come and do Macau? And what happened was um, Teddy actually bought the car from me and I drove it for him in Macau and we did uh, a couple of races in Japan and again in Singapore, which I won, this, I won the next Singapore Grand Prix. And um, then went to Macau and um, I was on pole position. Um, and um, I had a New Zealand mechanic, Ralph Hume, he's still a good mate, but uh, I'd asked Ralph to put a triple plate clutch in the car and hadn't realised that uh, the twin plate clutches were a bit fragile, especially a place like very twisty circuit or getting off the line. And I, uh, uh, I'd 
burnt the clutch out on the start line. So that that was the extent of my race. And then it was the next year I went there and won it for the first time. Also in the same the same march, but we would sort of kind of update it. Uh, we had narrow. We had a wide track suspension the first year and put a narrow track on it, and make it more nimble. Uh, and that car remained in Macau and um, was driven by Jonesy, Ayrton Senna. It's in the Macau Museum now. But yes, I pretty, heard pretty famous it car. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's but a it was a, no, car. the thing about Macau. It was, um, you know, for a young driver to go there for the first time. I, I think most young blokes and not intimidated by walls. I mean, in Ma Macau you had walls everywhere. In Singapore you had massive great ditches on the side of the road, storm drains, so that was pr maybe more dangerous if you ended up in the storm drain, you know. Uh, so we didn't really think about those things. It was just, you know, that was the track and you drove according. You drove it, never thinking you might whack the, you know, the concrete barrier or something. And in the early days, of course, it wasn't, uh, Armco didn't go all the way around. A lot of the barriers were bamboo barriers with trees behind them. <laughs> so it was just a very th thrilling uh, to go from driving Formula Fords and then start doing some of these uh, international events and uh, places like Macau were so different. Not just the racetrack, but uh, driving for Teddy Yip, you know, and he had it all sorted out that um, the company he was involved with owned the ferry company and. We were treated yes. like VIPs and never had to go through, just take our passports and we'd walk straight through, have a nice black Merc limo waiting to pick us up. And, and, the, and the Macau people and the whole sort of thing, it's, it is a very different, for people who haven't been, it is a very different place, isn't it? It's completely different. And Teddy used to drive. He'd usually only do one or two laps, but he'd walk around in the overalls for the weekend. And uh, one time there he said, and his house there used to roll, open up the garage doors, roll straight out onto the circuit, which obviously was a public road. But he said, uh, he said, Vern, take, take my car around. I've some problem with the gear, but it doesn't feel right. So I drove it around with all the traffic and everything. You know, they didn't <laughs> care, you know, this racing car and ended up down by the uh, ferry terminal with the thing jammed in gear on the pedestrian crossing, all these people then <laughs> milling around the car, you know, looking down at me like this and finishing up, picking up the car and lifting it off the road. So, you know, there was some quite um, memorable experiences with that place. Of course, the iconic race, I think of, you know, certainly from my point of view, and I think for most race fans is Le Mans. Uh, you raced there for many, many years and you had the good fortune of winning Le Mans. When, when you hear those words, Le Mans, what, what are the memories? Yeah, well, just, um, you know, it was one of those races, um, two o'clock in the morning, bang, they'd bang on the caravan door in the early days, motorhomes later on, and uh, say, your turn, your turn, the car's coming in, so you'd get back into these wet overalls and cold, and uh, at that particular time, you think, I must try and remember this next year because, you know, <laughs> but once you got back in the car, of course, you know, the, uh, it was just a really exhilarating place to drive and, and at night time too, because the, the cars were actually a little bit faster on the straight in the, with the cold air. Um, and of course you were on the, the Mulsanne straight when it was when the straight. Yeah, sure. No, no chicanes. And, and it was a fantastic track and it was a really quick track. So it suited the you know, the prototype sports cars. We were always overtaken lots of cars because there's 70 odd plus cars in the race with massive uh, differentials in the performance. Um, but yeah, I just, um, I think back on that, I only drove for the two teams and that was uh, the Golf, the Golf cars, the Mirages with John Wire and Horseman and then later on uh, Harley Cluxton bought the team. But I stayed with that, drove for them, I think seven times or something. And then, um, and then for Porsche, Porsche, I had a spell after when they Mirage stopped. I had a year out, and then uh, in '81, uh, after the Indy 500, uh, Rick Mears was supposed to drive for Porsche, and he had a accident, pit stop fire, and got a little burnt on the face. And uh, Porsche asked me if I'd like to come and drive for them, so I remained with them for nine years. And it was an extraordinarily successful 
period of time. And, and it was interesting because what some people might know is that, that car you, that you drove, um, later on you actually developed like a, a road going version of it. Tell us about that, the, the shoe plane. Well, um, in I think it was 88, I was driving in the Japanese championship. I'd been driving there. I uh, started driving there in 83 and a Japanese team, um, Nova Engineering, um, had approached Porsche about buying a 956 and um, having one of the works drivers do the championship. And so Porsche asked me if I'd like to do that, which is fantastic, you know. And of course the 956 was such a incredible car. Well, I'd, I'd already, you know, obviously that with the works cars, first of all, in 1982, I'd driven them and uh, done a number of the uh, World Championship 1000K races as well as Le Mans. So I thought, oh, yeah, you know, racing in Japan in one of these would be pretty good. And they used to get massive spectator attendance at, you know, 60,000, sometimes 80,000 spectators because all the races were televised. And we finish up in Japan. Uh, there were more Porsche 956s and 962s than there were racing in Europe. So um, that was, uh, it turned out in 1987 or 80, 80, yeah, 87, Rothmans Japan, it was Rothmans Marabeni, approached me about the possibility of running a, a, a Rothmans car for them. And it just so happened that I'd bought a crashed Rothmans 962 from Porsche um, that had a, a wet, very wet race at, um, I think it was Hockenheim, and Jochen Mass had crashed one car and Hans Stuck crashed the other. So they had these two kind of, well, in Porsche's minds, write offs because uh, they just rolled out a new chassis and, you know, put together another, another car. and. Um, so Reinhold Yost bought one of them, and um, I asked one day, I was at Porsche, I said, you know, could I buy that car? And they agreed to sell it to me. So I was having that car rebuilt when Rothmans approached me about, um, you know, maybe running a car in Japan. And uh, essentially that's what happened. We finished that car, ran that car for, um, and I was driving for another team. I wasn't even driving my own team. So I had um, Ray Borat, who was a GM, man and he used to, he was quite involved with Brocky going to Bathurst yes. and uh, Holden doing Bathurst and things like that. So I used to fly Ray out from Australia to manage the Rothmans car and then later on I had two, ran two cars in Japan um, and uh, I was dri so I was kind of driving against my own car but um, um, that, that culminated in an approach as I, well, as it went on over the next sort of 88, 89, I started thinking about uh, improving our cars by way of a carbon chassis. And I spoke to Porsche about it. They actually liked the idea and provided all the drawings. <coughs> and we had, a, we had a 962 tub. We sent that to a, one of the aerospace companies to build essentially a, a, a carbon monocoque that, uh, you could unbolt all your bits off your original aluminium chassis and bolt them onto my carbon tub. And the other, apart from, we felt that would be a safer uh, option and probably a better handling car, stiffer tub. Um, the 962s are becoming so valuable to collectors that if you bought one, they're actually worth more. Uh, so this idea was, you know, you'd be able to save or retain your original aluminium tub and run the carbon chassis and then put the car back to original. <laughs> and through that I was approached again by another uh, Japanese company um, about building a um, you know, street legal version of the 9 962. And that's a very long story how it all panned out. It didn't have a good ending, but we developed, we, um, we had two prototypes and we built a total of seven cars and we'd have them type approved and meeting emissions, <laughs> things like this. And we tested at Myra in England and, uh, and Ray Borat uh, joined me, left GM and actually came over and headed, 
headed that project up, the construction and first of the race cars and then later on, uh, you know, this road car project. And it just fell into the, um, unfortunately, the, you know, the late 80s financial crisis and the company involved were hoping to sell 25 cars off plan, if you like, and uh, that dip in the economy and the de de desire or demand for supercars and things like this uh, diminished to the extent that they, uh, they didn't cancel their order, but they said, we're not going to take delivery until we have a customer for each car, and essentially put me out of business. Well, that's so since you've, uh, since you've retired, I mean, there's so many things we could, we could talk about, but what's your involvement in the, in the sport? Do you keep in touch with the sport uh, much nowadays and have a look at what's happening locally and overseas? Obviously, you know, most guys follow Formula One if you've been involved in it at some time. Um, I get invited to events like Goodwood. Uh, used to do all the Festival of Speeds and then later the Revivals. Um, uh, Classic Le Mans, I've done, you know, three of those, that's every two years. Um, and there's other sort of anniversary of races like Macau or the Long Beach Grand Prix, the third anniversary of that I was invited to uh, drive a 5,000 car there. But I, I hadn't really got, I hadn't really had any desire to do the historic racing until um, they had a race in Adelaide for the 70s, 60s and 70s period Formula One cars. Um, wings, or actually prior to the wings, if you had a car with wings you had to take them off. And I was invited to drive the Gold Leaf Lotus 49 that uh, Graham Hill had won several Monaco Grand Prix and Jochen Rint and won in the car and uh, the Chapman family wrote to me and said uh, telling me all the history of the car and said, please be careful with it, it's our most treasured possession, you know. So uh, that was the first. That was kind of 12 years after I'd st stopped driving. Um, and it just sort of went from there that I started accepting a few invitations to do his some historic races. And apart, apart from driving that Formula One Lotus, which was just such a, a brilliant car, and it was kind of a car that I'd been, the, the period or era that I'd, Formula One cars that I drove, so it comes back very quickly when you race something and uh, you get back into it years later, it's still, you know, I get back into a 956 or something and remember where everything is and, you know, where I used to break it. Well, you know. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't take long to sort of, you know, get on the pace again. So. Um, uh, but I, you know, now I decided to really stop the historic race and um, the Goodwood before last. We went off with the family to the uh, the Whiskey Isles in Scotland and became a single malt expert. <laughs> yes, well, I think you know that's and the two are perhaps mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah. So, but the nice thing now is getting invited to events like uh, this historic. Sandown 50th anniversary of, uh, I guess, Lex Davidson's uh, death here, which yes. is unfortunately part of the whole, you know, motor racing happenings. It doesn't happen as much anywhere near as much these days, but a lot of our heroes were, as you know, were killed back yes. in the day. And uh, events like the Porsche, big event Porsche have every four years in the States, the Porsche Ren Sports, and they fly around about, I think this year they flew 20 of us over there for that reunion. Um, so just a big old get together, it's, it's a kind of social gathering, and if you drive a car, it's a bit of social demonstrations, if you like. Classic Adelaide, I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have done that a few times with Mercedes, so I'm kind of involved on the periphery, if you like, and enjoy the get-togethers when we all talk about how good we were. <laughs> well, it's, it's been a <laughs> well, it's been a remarkable career. I mean, it went so long, and I mean, some people do tend to, you know, sort of forget in terms of you know international success. The, the guy sitting next to me right now is is, is one of the legends of, of Australian motorsport, and uh, it's been a great privilege to uh, to talk. As I said, we could probably sit here all day, and uh, but you've got lots of lots of work to do, and in fact, so have we. So I think it's uh, it's time to say reluctantly, thank you for joining us. Uh, 
thank you for joining us, Vern, and uh, thanks for being on in pit lane. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.